Hi and welcome all. So as a bit of context, we have been publishing our predicted trends for the past five years or so. And these have ranged from cannabis tourism to voice activation to viewing Airbnb as a partner rather than a threat. And this year, I have had to approach my 2021 trends with a completely different outlook, having witnessed the global hospitality and real estate industries embrace so much change in such a short period of time. And in response to this, some of my predictions span slightly wider than just focusing on hotels which in some ways is a strong indicator of a further blurring of boundaries in the years to come. And this session is kindly sponsored by AKA Serviced Residences, and we're going to play a short video as a way of introducing the brand. Before we begin, I am going to run you through um, the format of this session. So unless you are speaking today, uh, we politely ask you to keep your cameras turned off and microphones on mute. This is simply so that we don't have any interference during our conversation. I'm essentially going to present six travel trends and our dedicated trendsetters are going to talk in further detail about three of these where I will host a very short Q&A. And throughout our conversation, we'd love to hear your thoughts, your opinions, your views. Um, if you have any questions, please do share these in the chat and I will do my best to keep an eye on the thread. And if we have time at the end, I will get round to asking these questions. So my name's Eloise Hansen. I am the news editor at Boutique Hotel News, and we are part of the international hospitality media portfolio. We are a B2B publisher and events producer for the hospitality industry. And we also run two other websites at Service Department News and Short Term Rentals. So we have a fantastic panel of trendsetters today and they are all going to say a, a few words of introduction. And I'm going to go from uh, left to right on my screen as per the PowerPoint. So David, can I please hand over to you first? Sure, my name is David Abraham. I'm a co-founder of Outpost. Uh, where we operate a network of live work properties focusing on remote workers in idyllic locations. We opened in uh, 2016, and we've been serving remote workers since. Um, I come from a background where uh, I worked in uh, commodities, energy trading, and finance, and also spent uh, several years working in the president's office in the United States as well. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks, David. And Lauren, can I hand over to you next, please? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Chatterton. I am the general manager at a privately owned, very small boutique hotel of hotels called Oddfellows, um, predominantly based in Chester, um, in Cheshire in the UK. And we also operate small serviced accommodation offsite in the form of apartments. So my job is very much balancing a busy city centre hotel along with the other side um, of extended stays in the apartments as well. 
um, and I'm currently on about 15, 16 years experience. So um, new challenges every day, as we know, in the hospitality industry, but I've worked for some very reputable um, privately owned businesses in the UK in terms of hospitality in the past 10 years. Brilliant. Thanks, Lauren. And Will, can I hand over to you next, please? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Will Lucas, the founder and CEO of Mint House. We are a tech-enabled hotel company uh, that is uh, operates a different type of hotel than is typically found in the traditional hotel industry. So first big difference is that we operate out of luxury multifamily buildings, so luxury apartment buildings. Uh, we're located in 11 cities and over 20 buildings around the country in the United States. Uh, and the second big difference is that we power the whole experience via technology. So everything from digital check-in to digital checkout to digital concierge and, and much more, which I'll, I'll get to uh, a little bit later. Uh, we focus our experience on the corporate traveler and the corporation, uh, and in turn, the remote worker, which of course has become you know, ever important in today's pandemic environment. Um, and look forward to, to chatting further. Thanks, Will. And um, last but not least, Ilana. Hi, everyone. I'm Ilana Friedman, CMO of AKA Serviced Residences. Um, AKA is part of Corman Communities, which is a four generation, 100 year old family business. Um, we've got four and five markets, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Washington, DC, and the UK. Um, and we have three key segments. We have the business traveler, leisure traveler. Ilana, we've lost you. a pioneer in the luxury long stay category. I'm thrilled to be sponsoring the panel. Awesome. Thanks so much. So from these introductions, you might already get a sense of what we're going to be talking about be talking about today. So let's begin with my first trend. It's up on your screens now and this is one that's incredibly broad and far-reaching and that is the anywhere worker finds their any place office. And my reason for highlighting this trend right at the beginning is that the ripple effect of remote working which has so quickly become normalized is vast we are presented with this tremendous opportunity to reimagine the traditional nine to five, which is no longer bound to the office. Um, we have some statistics from Global Workplace Analytics, who predicts that around 25 to 30 percent of the global workforce is expected to work from home multiple days a week by the end of 2021. So your place of work, be that your office, your co-working office, um, could increasingly start to appear as pockets or hubs that are already integrated into existing spaces. And this is where the potential scope and scale of the idea is just enormous because it can extend far beyond the, the typical hotspots of remote work in your hotel lobbies and your cafes to maybe include things such as retail like garden centres and leisure facilities such as gyms. And this is where this domino effect really comes into play because the freedom of movement that's granted by remote working really opens up the horizon. And we have seen countries like Barbados and Estonia who have all introduced a digital nomad visa to attract this emerging uh, anywhere worker. And so I think that the office will no longer be static but a very dynamic and mobile setting, which brings me in or on to David. So David, Outpost has four locations across Bali and Cambodia. How do you think remote working is going to change our relationships with secondary, even far-flung destinations? I, I think, uh, Eloise, thanks for, thanks for having, having us here. We've focused on remote work for the past four, four and a half years. Uh, it was a niche trend. Um, and through COVID, we've seen Fujitsu, Nomura, Facebook, Saying people are going to remote work, 
permanently. And that allows people to move for days, weeks, or months at a time. Um, the, the question is how many people, how often may they travel? And I think that's really an, an open question. But the one thing that's really resonated with me is a study that Booking.com did about uh, a month ago. And they came out to say that 37% of all of their travelers are considering booking a trip to a location where they can work. And to me, that number is astounding because in Bali, where we've, we've spent uh, most of our, or where most of our operations are, we have about 10 million foreign visitors a year coming through. Coming through. And of that, maybe 0.5% of those people were deciding to come there to work. And now, so we have this fundamental change where people are allowing themselves to spend time in places that they want to be. So what it, it does is it, it unlocks this, this trend of remote work. And these workers are different than leisure workers who traveled to locations for business and then stayed on for leisure and would spend four days um, after a, a trip to Hong Kong for a business meeting, and then they would stay on. But now people are deciding where they want to go to work. And what that means is that we can expect those people who are traveling with, with jobs to spend longer in one place um, so that they won't be traveling around as much. They won't be moving from um, different uh, accommodations. So you expect longer stays. Um, so the opportunity really comes in the, as we say, the medium term market. I'm giving, uh, giving people at the minimum a space where they feel comfortable to spend a long period of time. And the question is, what type of worker are you looking for? And then what type of product can you offer? Uh, we focus on people who are entrepreneurial, they're creative, they're internationally minded, they're on average between 24 and, and 40. So we offer services that tailor to them. Uh, those would be different than someone who's tailoring, for example, to families who may travel and work. Mm -hmm. And this brings, uh, or uh, ties in quite nicely with my next question, as if we were to focus this particularly on hoteliers, where is the opportunity for hoteliers to capture this emerging anywhere worker, be that in those secondary locations? Well, the, the opportunity really comes in in, in targeting a, a medium term stay model. That's at the very basics. Um, but we found through our experience is the question that most of the people who come to Outpost ask, they're not looking for a, a bed and a desk. They don't ask us um, how big the room is. What they're really interested in when they're coming for work and especially for extended stays is who they're going to meet there and what events are going on. So it's really about focusing on what type of people you want to come to your place mm -hmm. and what's the product offering. And for some people, for some brands, it makes sense to continue to offer what they offer and then highlight that people can, can work in, in, in that particular location. For other folks, it's a question of thinking through the exact product that they want to offer. Um, and that's really what we've been doing for the past four or five, four, actually five years now, um, is really to hone that product down so that we can attract the, the exact set of people that, that we want. And really that's done through social activities, that's done through events, uh, we're more in line with the social aspect of a hostel, mm -hmm. but really the privacy that you expect um, when you don't really want to share a room uh, with somebody. Mm -hmm. And within your four and a half, five years, how are you seeing the demographic of the digital nomad changing? It's been fascinating. So it's really been a niche uh, market. It was something, it was a project um, Outpost was a project I started as a, a side project for me. And then we saw the trends change from remote work and, and offices. We saw them becoming more networks than physical spaces. And we don't see the office necessarily falling away um, because we believe that communities themselves are really built on proximity and kind of this emptiness that many of us feel now in this COVID environment um, is exacerbated um, not just because of the tensions of, of, of COVID and, and the illnesses and being at home all the time, but the lack of con physical connection that we have with other people. So it's always been our real focus is to bring people together uh, so that people could have shared experiences. Um, so that's one thing that's, that's always been important to us. But in terms of the demographics and, and changing is that we've seen that people who first started this trend of, of remote work and digital nomadism 
we're really focusing on remote work in a, in a, in a, in a focus on themselves. I want to work where I want to work, when I want to work, and how I want to work. And now seeing companies start to enter this space, it's really become regimented. And how can we live the lifestyle so that people can explore the world and still contribute meaningfully at work? It's really creating this ultimate live work balance. And to me, that's more exciting because I believe that remote work can enhance people's lives when they're contributing to um, not only their self-awareness um, and, 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 and fulfilling their own dreams, but also staying responsible to the companies that they are, um, that they are a part of. Mm -hmm. And, and sadly, throughout this year, um, COVID has pretty much ruled business travel obsolete. Meetings and events haven't happened. Um, and as a result, we have seen many hotel brands uh, diversify operations away from this. So what can hotels learn from a, a co-living, co-working model like Outpost? I think when we talk about it's, it's the co part. It's the community, the, the, the togetherness aspect. And for, for all brands that, that, may not, that may not resonate, people are, aren't going all the way around the world to some um, locales to, to meet with others. Um, they really want to have that indulgent self-experience um, where they're with their significant other or, or family. Uh, but what we see is that when people are going for a extended period of time and going from location to location, they really want to focus on who they're connecting with. Um, hotel owners could look at one, the long-term nature of co-living. It's, it's um, spending more time with people and then also focusing on the collaborative element. Mm -hmm. And my final question for you, David, is do you think that we are going to see um, a further blurring of boundaries within hospitality in 2021? For, for us, it's, it's that social aspect. Um, that's, that's strong. We feel that people after this uh, challenge in next, mid next year are really going to want to connect uh, physically and meaningfully with people. So how do we create that, that social environment? And for us, it's entrepreneurial and creative. For others, it may be our focus around yoga. For others, it may be focused around arts. Um, so there, there are many different models that can really capture um, people's attentions and draw um, people uh, into a community for remote work. It doesn't necessarily have to focus on remote work. It's just got to be able to spawn that connections that people have around some type of meaningful shared, in, uh, shared interest and shared values. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. And we are actually going to be talking about the sort of the local community and the importance of the local community later on in our conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my next trend is looking at uh, repurposing hotels and their spaces. Um, the halt in travel has sadly resulted in empty guest rooms and conference rooms, unused banqueting halls and other underutilized spaces. And this has prompted many owners to reimagine functionalities. And something that I've been picking up on here in the UK is the refurbishment of meeting rooms into fully equipped studios. And on your screens now, the left-hand picture is uh, Penny Hill Park, which has recently unveiled the event studio and it has TV cameras and stage lighting and uh, production facilities. And on the right, we've got the Royal Lancaster London, which invested 1.8 million in kitting out its XR mixed reality production studio. And transforming these spaces coincides with a much larger trend of hosting hybrid events. I mean, we've all increased our digital communications um, over the last year. And a survey by Cvent of 700 event planners revealed that over three quarters are considering hosting a hybrid event next year. And as such, venues are now expected to be ready to support these kinds of events and therefore technology ranks as an important consideration. And 77% of respondents said that reliable, fast connectivity and AV equipment is valued most highly in terms of enabling that hybrid experience. So I would expect 
that to advance one's competitive edge, venues will continue to repurpose along these lines in order to capture that demand when it returns, because it will return, we just don't know in what shape or form as of yet. And as a result of this work from home culture, vacant office blocks and retail stores also offer the chance to convert. And hotels in tourist heavy gateway cities do remain an, an attractive asset for investment despite the challenges they have faced thus far. And I'm going to pick up on Covent Garden in London. Um, as an example, we have Mannix Properties who's transforming a former office building into an Emano branded hotel and the Portfolio Club will convert the entire Wellington block into one of several residence clubs. But looking outside of London, the appeal of other cities for investment is changing. And this graph on your screens now is taken from Deloitte's 2020 European Hotel Industry Survey. And this graph shows the five uh, top five UK regional cities for hotel investment in 2021. And Edinburgh has been pushed down to third place with Cambridge and Oxford topping the chart perhaps as a result of the interest in staycations. And also in this survey, uh, respondents expect that investment will mainly be sourced from the UK and North America. And perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, in spring next year, AJ Capital Partners, which is based in Chicago, is going to debut its graduate hotels brand in Europe, in Cambridge and Oxford. So with further development activity expected in places like Oxford, such as the repurposing of Boswell's department store into a boutique hotel, we might see uh, these cities and others like it growing in supply relative to high demand levels. So moving on, Deloitte further noted that serviced apartments have overtaken hotels to become the most attractive asset class to invest in Europe for 2021, which brings me on to my next trend of hotels pivoting to extended stay. Now, the resilience of serviced apartments has been largely observed during the pandemic. And one of the latest reports from the Highland Group shows that in the States, the extended stay hotel sector has outperformed the overall hotel industry in quarter three of 2020. And even preliminary data back in April indicated that extended stay properties were suffering far less than their traditional hotel counterparts. And all five of the largest hotel groups, so that's Wyndham, Choice, Marriott, IHG and Hilton, have managed extended stay properties for many years. But changing traveller needs as a result of the pandemic is accelerating the transition amongst other brands. We are seeing names such as Ace Hotels, Four Seasons, 25 Hours and others like them are all diversifying into this market. So now I am going to bring in Lauren and Ilana to talk in further detail about this trend. And I'd like to begin with Lauren, please. Um, as you mentioned that you run the uh, service departments arm at Odd Fellows. So my first question is, did the apartments remain open whilst the hotel closed and at what occupancy did they operate if so? So firstly, hello to everybody again. and Thank you very much for asking me to join today. Um, I'm delighted to talk to you a little bit about um, our service departments during the pandemic, really. And so you can have some understanding that although the hotel was shut, we did keep um, the apartments open as a home from home. Um, they weren't used for leisure. However, they were predominantly used for the people that were um, working within the area. It was so our apartments are spacious. They're large. They're home from home. We did have to take away the serviced element which I'll go into more detail about later and they were purely self-catering accommodation um, but we did see that we had long stays up to one month at a time during the pandemic for people to uh, come and base themselves who perhaps couldn't be with their family because of the risk of um, 
transmission, um, but we did occupy um, the apartments at a 65% occupancy during the pandemic. Um, now, considering the hotel was closed completely, it's really interesting with the occupancy because um, we're actually operating now at 96% occupancy for the apartments. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a 22% growth on the occupancy, um, purely because people want a private space and are moving away from the um, meeting on a hotel corridor, um, sort of just wanting a home from home, really. Mm -hmm. And would you be able to talk us through some of the similarities and differences between the apartments and the hotel in terms of the operations, the length of stay, but also the guest demographic? Absolutely. So it's really important for us to have a distinction between the hotel and the apartments, although they are both part of our offering. They're literally a two minute walk from the hotel, uh, just a completely different offering to Airbnb. So as we all know, Airbnb is flooding the market and they have some fantastic properties. And Chester um, in Cheshire also is packed with beautiful periodic buildings within the Roman uh, walled city. Um, so there are beautiful properties that are available for private letting uh, for short term and for long term. Um, but we kind of section ourselves away from that in the market. Um, so where Airbnb is a, you check into somebody's property, you stay, you leave it as you found it. With us, we, it's, it's very different because all of the nice elements of staying in a hotel, we bring to your own personal space at the apartment. So that house is yours for however long you choose to stay. And staycations have been hugely popular this year. Um, but at the same time, we offer things that wouldn't usually be offered in those uh, serviced accommodations. So daily housekeeping, breakfast hampers delivered in the mornings, um, you know, feasts prepared in the evening, which are stored in the fridge, ready for you to cook yourselves in your own private space, hamper evenings for ladies, for celebrations such as hem parties, bridal showers. Um, and, and the nicety is that we're a two minute walk so they can come up to the hotel to also use our facilities for anything that they might like to. So they can stay over in the apartment, but if they don't want to cook breakfast, we're a short two minute walk and we can offer that breakfast to them. We were always based between the three and four night stays, whereas now we're seeing seven plus nights. Um, and it's particularly popular with the families. So I, as a mother myself, know that it can be quite tricky staying in hotels. But to have that city centre location on the doorstep of the Chester River D, the coffee shops, the retail shopping, but have your own parking space, have a, you know space to cook and things like that is really important to that demographic. And talking about our demographics, um, it's similar to our hotel offering, but people often see Odd Fellows as sort of a your young couples or your corporate business travelling, where actually. The grey pound is significant to us and we see a lot of the older generation, the sort of empty nesters that have time to enjoy a break with cocktails in the afternoon and that want to come and just explore different cities within the UK and don't want to necessarily move abroad anymore um, has really become a large chunk of our demographic. We look at almost 30% is the older generation that's choosing to come and stay with us and particularly using the apartments. Interesting insights. Thank you. And I'd like to move over to uh, Ilana um, for my next question, please. Um, as I know that AKA has a, has a hotel in New York um, alongside all the apartments that you also um, operate. So can you tell us mm -hmm. about what booking behavior that you are seeing at uh, this hotel specifically? Sure, sure. Um, so we're seeing even, you know, shorter booking windows than we've been seeing over the past year, sometimes inside of one week, which, you know, we all know that makes it quite a challenge to predict your future business. Sorry, Alana, we've any any you. risk that they won't be able to, that they won't be. Okay, we have Alana, if you can hear me, we have lost reservation your cancellation audio. Policy. You're not hearing my audio? It, it's, it's stalled ever so slightly. Uh, carry on and we'll see how far we can get uh, with the booking behavior at the, uh, oh. at the hotel. Okay, I 
think it must have gone. So let's um, let me finish off with a question to Lauren, please. In that, do looking at the um, the difference between the hotel and the apartments, do you think that hoteliers will look to incorporate apartments into their offering in 2021 and why? Yes, so um, this has obviously been natural to us for a few years as we've had our service accommodation in place since 2016. So we will really a standout property as something different. It's not, it was definitely not the trend for the past few years until perhaps the latter of last year and into 2020. Um, a slight halt due to um, the pandemic. However, I think the way forward and moving forward with hospitality, with all the other areas that we've tied in about virtual working, uh, you know, remote working, things like that, it is the way forward and something that I feel that most hoteliers will have to sort of join in um, because it's almost a necessity now that people are looking for remote accommodation close to the amenities that they want without having to have the interaction or the, um, the, the sort of the, I'm trying to think of the best word for it, but basically coming into contact with the rest of the public. And I think that's even before the pandemic. People just enjoy being able to go away and be where they want to be, but all have the comforts of a home from home. And that's exactly what uh, remote service accommodation offers for you, You've, especially if it's tied and linked to a hotel like it is with us, because if you want to go to the hotel and use the bar or have dine in the restaurant or have breakfast or spa treatments, they're all things you can do. But then once you finish that, you can go back to the privacy of your own home from home, should we say, and you can relax and cook yourself some dinner. And it's just a much more relaxed way of enjoying your break. And it's so much easier to um, sort of um, plan your visit and not have work around restrictions and things like that. So it's something that we are looking to do in our sister property, which is in Cheadle, just outside of Manchester at the moment. And um, with it being so popular and lots of place service accommodations popping up in Chester, um, it's also going to grow into the Northwest. So you're Manchester and Liverpool and areas like that. So that's something that we're looking for to do. And I would certainly recommend it for other hoteliers who perhaps are struggling with occupancy in the hotel bedrooms as an alternative. Um, that seems to be um, just growing at the moment rather than seeing any decrease. So there's some positivity for hospitality at the moment. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. And I'm gonna try and come back to Ilana. Um, sorry that uh, we had a bit of disruption with your audio here. Um, I have a question about the work from home culture um, as the extended stay sector has traditionally been geared towards the business traveler. Um, is the work from home culture steering AKA's direction perhaps more towards that leisure guest? How's my audio now? Can you hear me? I can. Great. So we haven't really had to shift more towards leisure. You know, AKA, as I mentioned before, has three key categories, leisure, business, and this, then this lifestyle transition category. And this lifestyle transition category is so core to who we are as a brand. These are people that are going through something in their life it could be a home renovation, medical tourism. Um, oh, unfortunately. It really helps to balance all of our segments and create stability because this. Oh, I'm sorry, Alana, we've lost you again, side, I'm afraid. Um, we've all been impacted. And can you not hear me now? Oh, we can hear you now. It's it's jumping around a little bit, I'm afraid. I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's absolutely fine. I do have, um, see if we can carry on with um, a, a question um, as sort of chief marketing officer. If you had to give advice to hoteliers who are looking to target and attract that new pool of longer stay guests, what would it be? Well, I'd say that, you know, earlier to what David said about really thinking about what that long-term traveler needs it's very different than what somebody who's looking to stay at a hotel for two or three days is. So stay very focused on thinking about what matters when you will be somewhere for a week or a month. It's quite different. I would also suggest pretty straightforward, look at the physical asset of the real estate. You need to be able to deliver as much space as possible for longer stays, a kitchen or some way to prepare food, and then what used to be the most unsexy amenity is now the sexiest amenity, laundry. 
if you can handle, if you can deliver space, kitchen, laundry, and service, you'll be much, it'll be much easier for you to attract that longer stay guest. Brilliant. Thanks, Ilana, and thanks, sure. Lauren, for your for your insights. So, I'm going to move on to my next trend, which is one. Um, that is certainly um, a hot topic of conversation at the moment, and that is the explosion of the subscription economy. And even before the pandemic started, subscription services were steadily on the rise. It's a trend driven by consumer demand that has been growing in popularity for many years. And on your screens now, are a couple of graphs taken from the 2020 edition of the Subscription Economy Index, which found that overall subscriptions are on the rise and that businesses which use a subscription-based model uh, have actually expanded at a rate of 12%. Now, the left graph shows the annualized revenue growth of subscriptions around the world, and the right graph shows the, how the net account growth rate, so that is the um, percentage of gained subscribers, has surpassed re uh, rates recorded in the second half of 2019. And I'd like to read out um, a paragraph from this uh, research paper, as I think it highlights the, uh, the um, po positives and the benefits of a subscription model. So it says, Companies with subscription models consistently demonstrate three capabilities that bolster their resilience. The agility to launch new revenue streams, the automation capabilities to adapt to an increasingly digital world, and the insights from leveraging rich customer data to improve the subscriber experience. These functions differentiate subscription companies and enable them to manage for resilience while continuing to grow despite challenging times. And so the pandemic really is just accelerating trends that were already on the rise. And this data demonstrates that subscription models drive growth. And when travel came to a stop, this has compelled many hospitality businesses to seek out these new revenue streams. Citizen M led the charge on this front. They launched it uh, corporate subscription and global passport. We have Marriott, Accor and Karma Group as other big names to have introduced similar payment plans. And it's perhaps unsurprising that efforts are focused on the lucrative business traveller. I mean, MICE was a significant source of income for hotels prior to the lockdowns and the social restrictions. And in effect, it's a clever and resourceful move for hotels to monetize the way that they already operate. But looking wider afield, airlines such as Lufthansa and Volaris have their flight pass and V pass respectively. And travel group Inspirato claims to be one of the first operators to adopt a fully subscription based model. Now, Inspirato offers travellers access to hotels, but also private vacation homes and experiences. And this is the first that I've come across personally, where a subscription service spans different accommodations and on a global level. And I think that it's a strong indicator that it um, subscriptions may well become subsumed into other segments of the travel industry, too. And this brings me on to my next trend, as one such service that people have been um, subscribing to is your food and or delivery. And we, here we have dark kitchens, and these are also known as ghost kitchens and satellite kitchens. And this model works um, from an operator leasing a secondary site, such as a hotel kitchen, a shipping container, or um, any other industrial unit to cook and produce meals for consumption either on premises but also elsewhere. And these dark kitchens can essentially allow for the continuation of operations, albeit on a takeaway basis, when restaurants, hotels and other dining venues are forced to close. 
the challenge, however, lies with um, establishing a name or a reputation in a very competitive online world, as dark kitchens rely heavily on digital ordering. And the potential success of a dark kitchen can be understood when you start to look at the um, how digital and contactless solutions are being widely adopted in hospitality. A study by Crichton uh, that was published only in August uh, showed that 47% of respondents said that they would be more likely to take advantage of room service and 48% more likely to visit the hotel restaurant if they could order via an app. And during the first UK lockdown, companies such as Flipdish, which specialise in the online ordering for restaurants, saw increased interest from hotels that were looking to set up a digital ordering system. So this tells me that there is appetite from hoteliers to expand their business. And therefore, we are going to hear from Will, who can talk to us more about the dark kitchen trend. So Will, I believe you have partnered with A Dark Kitchen. So what has prompted the decision to work with A Dark Kitchen? Yes, uh, and so thanks again for having me on. So we uh, operate our hotels out of multifamily buildings that don't come with the traditional physical hotel amenity infrastructure. Uh, so you won't find physical check-in desks uh, or areas and, and desks to support a, a physical concierge and, and there are no uh, kitchens in the building that would you know be typically used to, to power things like room service. Uh, we actually think those physical features are, are not necessary uh, in today's day and age with the technology that's available and so we actually aim to replicate or exceed all of the amenities that you would typically find at a four-star hotel through technology in our guest experience. Uh, so we offer uh, digital check-in, as I mentioned, digital checkout, digital concierge, uh, customized fridge stocking. So you can actually pick out what you want via SMS link or on our app. It's waiting in the fridge upon arrival. You can order uh, on-demand massages. You can exercise in room uh, to live classes through our partnership with the uh, Fitness Mirror. Uh, and then lastly, you can you can order branded room branded mint house room service powered by ghost kitchens. Uh, so while traditional room service is in decline, I, I believe it's down 25% uh, over the last five years as new grub as Grubhub, Seamless, DoorDash, Uber Eats have gained popularity. Uh, we find that there's a significant segment of our customers that find that process a little overwhelming. So when you're in a new city to be hit with that much choice with a bunch of restaurants that you're not familiar with can be daunting. And so that's where we step in with our ghost kitchen offering, which limits the choice and gives the stamp of Mint House's brand behind the menu that we're providing. Um, and so that has been the, the, the reason behind our choice to, to move into room service branded by Mint House, powered by Ghost Kitchens. Uh, we think it's a, a, a also a, a powerful time to be able to reinforce our brand uh, with our customers. Mm -hmm. And can you please talk us through the, the partnership? Um, perhaps first we can maybe just talk about the logistics. So um, how you, do, do you provide the menu? Do they provide the menu? Where are they based? Um, and then we can move on to the sort of the commercial breakdown of the, of the partnership. Certainly. So we do this now in two of our locations with plans to roll this out. As I mentioned, we're in 11 markets around the United States today. Uh, so in the first case, in, in New York City, we offer through a traditional ghost kitchen. So we have a third party that actually powers the logistics for us. We select the menu uh, in partnership with the ghost kitchen and the third party service provider. Uh, we take 10%, so you can log into a web app. Uh, you know, Typical menu items that you would find you know, sorted by breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Uh, and you can, uh, 
when it arrives, it, it looks and feels like traditional room service in that there'll be Mint House branding and it feels like it came from us and you don't necessarily even know that it was powered by a third party uh, logistics provider and or a ghost kitchen. We take 10% of that total order um, and uh, so uh, otherwise functions, you know, like room service from the guest point of view. In other cases, uh, in, the, in the second market, we actually are, uh, have a custom menu that we work with an existing restaurant. So not a ghost kitchen, but a restaurant where we have a custom menu. And again, we're using a third party uh, log logistics provider to facilitate that custom menu that we uh, worked on with, the, with those two groups. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think it's probably, I mentioned this before, but it's, it, it's worth noting that on top of that, we do offer the, the third option, which isn't you know, typically available at, at, at a hotel, uh, which is the, the custom uh, fridge stocking. So if you would, you know, if you are, uh, would rather not order out and, and cook your own food, you know, you like a certain thing for breakfast, it's granola, it's eggs, you know, you are available to, to have that in your fridge when you arrive and of course reorder um, from us as well. And one question um, that oh, I've heard this um, subject discussed at, at conferences when they, they used to happen um, about evaluating risk uh, with, it, with it being a sort of third party operator, where does that risk lie and how are you assessing that personally? Yeah, so the, you know, I think the most important part to understand as we consider risk is that these contracts are cancelable immediately. And uh, with ghost kitchens popping up all over the cities uh, today, there are plenty of options to switch over to a kitchen if food quality or you know, delivery times are suffering. Um, you know, in terms of actual liability, uh, you know, I think that we would share that liability if there was, you know, if something went significantly wrong, just like a hotel would. We believe that it's a you know, minimal risk, and of course, we can change directions and switch out the kitchen, and you know, even even provide variety if, if we so choose by by moving the kitchens uh, from time to time. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thanks, Will. So. Before we move on to my final trend, I just want to um, highlight what I meant um, when I was speaking earlier about subscriptions. Um, what is this subscription to what? So when I when I was uh, talking about subscriptions, you can pay a, a monthly fee. Say um, say at I'll use Citizen M as an example. You pay a monthly fee, and you can travel between the Citizen M properties um, for an. X amount of properties for that month. Um, you have a minimum night, uh, a minimum night spend at the hotel. You can have like a free cocktail on arrival. You have um, maybe exclusive use for up to five hours on one of the meeting rooms. Um, and when I talked about the um, the flight passes, again, you pay a monthly fee, um, and you can either get um, a discount on your flights around a, a certain area, or you have, say, 10 flights to make within six months. So that's just a, a sort of brief outline of what I meant by subscriptions within hospitality and travel. So let's move on to my final trend, uh, which is one that I'm uh, very excited about. It's regenerative travel. And as I highlighted at the beginning of this webinar, uh, we've been running our predicted trends for several years now. And last year, I highlighted how sustainable solutions will gain momentum. And we have seen hospitality brands take those steps in the right direction. Um, and these have generally been focused around the supply chain. So it can be cutting single use plastics, moving to reusable products, uh, sourcing products that are more local. Um, but regenerative travel is one step further than sustainability. It's an evolution of the trends that we are already seeing in the industry. And in a nutshell, Regenerative travel is about actively improving the social and environmental conditions of the area, region or country that someone is visiting. 
and in the weeks and months that we have spent in lockdown, um, either individually but also collectively, that it has shone a bright light on the local community. And there has been a global effort to support and serve those most in need. And we've had uh, brands like the Hoxton in LA and Portland who offered rooms to wildfire evacuees. And we have uh, Rosewood Hotels in Bangkok that created a, a food delivery service for frontline workers. And it's this act of giving back that's feeding into the much larger and deep rooted trend of regenerative travel where the entire premise is about building back better. And about a month ago, I spoke to uh, Luca Franco, the CEO of Luxury Fun Frontiers, and he described the biggest cultural behavior shift stemming from the pandemic as traveling with purpose. And he believes that this will manifest itself in greener, smarter, and certainly less traveled trips. He said, regenerative travel is to leave a place in a better condition than when we found it. And I'd argue that the psychological effects of the pandemic, where our sensitivities have been heightened for such a prolonged period of time, is going to change how we value our relationships with ourselves, with the people around us, and also our environments. And this is supported by a survey from Clink Hostels, which revealed that 86% of respondents felt that companies should do more to challenge social, political, and environmental issues. And Mark Fenelon, CEO of Clink, said, our guests are clearly asking companies to have purpose as well as profit and to move beyond faceless donations and self-servicing promotion. There is a whole generation out there with passionate beliefs and a strong moral compass. They want to travel, but they also want to give back to their communities and the destination they travel to. And with this in mind, those hotel brands that are championing and supporting specific causes are most likely to resonate with travellers. Brands are going to be remembered for what they take a stand for. And for that reason, I think that businesses will start seeking to cater to this behavioural change. We're already seeing um, Hyatt Hotels, for example, rolling out its Hyatt Loves Local initiative worldwide, where Hyatt is collaborating with small businesses and hosting them on property. So the seeds for sustainable solutions were planted long before the pandemic and the green shoots of regenerative travel are now sprouting. And so to end my presentation on a high note, I'm going to bet that regenerative travel is in fact here to stay well beyond 2021. The local community in whatever shape or form that might look like is the beating heart of any travel experience. And one can only hope that efforts, efforts are geared towards not just trying to preserve that culture, but improving it too. And that sums up my 2021 Trend Setter webinar. And before we close off, I am going to run through um, a few slides uh, well, before we crack on with our days. So tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. UK time, my colleague Paul Stevens is hosting his Trends webinar aimed at the short term rental audience and the registration link will be posted in the chat. And on January the 18th, I am thrilled to be returning with my Trailblazer 2.0 webinar series. And in the first session, I will be discussing incremental revenue streams as we look to explore what hoteliers can do to support business during traditionally quieter months and the full webinar schedule will be posted in the chat and I would love to see you all there. So thank you all for joining me today and a special thank you to our wonderful trendsetters uh, David, Lauren, Ilana and Will and to AKA for sponsoring. 
And to close off our session today, I'm going to play a short parody video that myself and the team recorded a couple of weeks ago, inspired by the significant increase in our digital communications this year. And it makes me giggle every time I watch it, and I hope it does for you guys as well. Once again, thank you all for joining us today and we will see you once again in the new year. Do take care and we'll see you soon.